Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. A little easier to talk this way, excuse me. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's program, Sunday at the Getty with James, the making of Sunday in the Park with George. <laughs> my name is Greg Sandoval of the J. Paul Getty Museum Public Programs. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's presentation. This program is being presented in partnership, excuse me, uh, with partnership with the Center Theater Group. Um, they have been terrific collaborators, and I want to thank them for making this event possible. I am joining you from the Getty Center in Los Angeles on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Gabrieleno Tongva peoples, past, present, and future, with honor and respect for their deep history of this region. Before I introduce our guests, I wanted to share a couple of program details for our attendees on Zoom. Um, for, to access live captioning, click the CC button on your Zoom menu bar along the bottom of your screen. Also, feel free to submit questions to our panelists anytime during the conversation using the Q&A function. For our guests here in the auditorium, we ask that you hold your questions towards the end of the program and then make your way to the, stand, the two standing mics at the end of the aisles. Today's program coincides with James Lapine's recently published book, Putting It Together, How Stephen Sondheim and I Created Sunday in the Park with George. Um, putting It Together is a deeply personal remembrance of Lapine and Sondheim's collaboration and friendship and the highs and lows of that journey, one that resulted in the beloved Pulitzer Prize winning classic. The book will be available for purchase here um, on site after the program and for our viewers online, we will share a link um, to purchase that, uh, that title as well. A few words about Lapine and Sondheim. James Lapine is a preeminent director, playwright, screenwriter, and librettist. He has been nominated for 12 Tony Awards and won on three occasions for Best Book of a Musical. He has also won five Drama Desk Awards, a Pulitzer for Drama, a Peabody Award, among other honors. He has been inducted in the Theater Hall of Fame and is recipient of the Mr. Abbott Award for Lifetime Achievement in Theater. Stephen Sondheim is a composer, lyricist, and Broadway icon. He is the recipient of eight Tony Awards, including a Tony for Lifetime Achievement in Theater, a Pulitzer Prize in Drama, Academy Award for Best Song, eight Grammy Awards, eight Drama Desk Awards, and many other honors. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama in 2015. James is going to be joined today by Richard Rand, who is Associate Director of Collections of the J. Paul Getty Museum. Previously, he served as the Robert and Martha Berman Lip Senior Curator of Paintings and Sculpture at the Sterling and Francine Clark Art Institute. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming James Lapine and Richard Rand. Thank you very much for that wonderful applause. Yeah, it's great. That, that's we good. You applause. did good. <laughs> it's, it's great to be back in a live auditorium to hear applause. Uh, this is, just so you know, this is the first live event at the Getty in 18 months. So, And I can't think of a more of a better way to reinaugurate the Harold Williams Auditorium than to talk about one of the great Broadway musicals of, of all time with one of its creators, James Lapine. Welcome, James. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yes. So just quickly, let me tell you a little bit. We're, we're going to be in conversation about, uh, about the musical, about Georges Seurat as an artist, and of course, his singular masterpiece. Uh, let, me, let me put it on the screen right now. There it is. Uh, Sunday afternoon on the island of the Grand Jatt, one of the iconic paintings in the history of art, beloved masterpiece that currently hangs at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, we'll, we'll get into the nitty gritty of this painting and its imagery and how it relates to 
to this wonderful musical. And of course, it's all to do with James's new book, which I, I have here, which a wonderful read, putting it together, how Stephen Sondheim and I created Sunday in the Park with George. Um, it's, it's a wonderful personal and sort of insider look at how one creates a great work of art. Um, and so I'd like, I think maybe James, I'd just start by asking about the impetus behind writing this book, because after all, it's been nearly 40 years since you and Sondheim began the creative process. What, what led you to this moment to, to get it all out into this, into this book? Um, well, I remember uh, seeing the image in Chicago. Uh, my dad was a salesman, and he had um, the Chicago Housewares Mart every year in Chicago, and I went one year to um, help him out, whatever it was, and when I had a spare minute, I went to the Art Institute of Chicago, and I'd never, I wasn't a, uh, a big art aficionado, but we, I went to... Um, the museum, and when I saw this painting in person, it was just um, so magnetic and, and um, this is going to sound weird to say, but bottomless as an object to study. It just, you could just, I don't know how long I stood in front of it, but it just seemed to have so much mystery to it. So anyway, it just kind of stayed in my, my mind, and um, I'm going to skip forward, because uh, if you've read the book, it would be very repetitive for me to give you the whole spiel, but uh, when I met Sondheim and um, we kind of hit it off and decided we were going to write something together, I brought a bunch of images, one of which was this one, which I had used in the very first show I had ever done. I was a photographer and graphic designer before I moved into the theater. So um, uh, it just, as Steve said, looking at it, he said it looks like a stage event, you know, a stage set. and. Um, we kind of riffed on it, and um, I just kind of dove in and started writing, and um, basically tapping mostly into the unconscious about it. I didn't read anything about Seurat. I didn't really know the history of the painting. Uh, I just knew that the image was something that I thought um, spoke to the theater. Well, that's, that, I mean, that's very clear just looking at the painting. And later on, if we have time, we'll look at some images of how Seurat created this masterpiece. And he really did begin with the sight with, without figures. Yeah. So it looks exactly as you say, as a stage set, and then brings on the, you know, the dramatis personae um, in, in a very theatrical, dramatic way. I mean, it's interesting. So you. You and Sondheim didn't really study the history of the painting or of, of Seurat because we don't actually know a lot about who these figures are meant to be. You mm. had to, you, that, that gave you the freedom just to create Exactly, yeah. yeah. I didn't really want to know, frankly, and I didn't mm. want to know about him. I wanted to see if we could surmise our own story based on the image and not do some kind of historical you know, representation, theatrical representation, you know. One of those, remember all those movies in the 50s on artists who were always, you know, tormented and whatever. Anyway, Charles Lawton as Rembrandt. Yeah. And when Kirk, Ag agony and the ecstasy. Yeah, and Kirk Douglas was really all upset about something he was painting. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> Actually, was, I think it was, has a Sarai in it. He was Van Gogh. Van Gogh, lust, lust right. Lust for yeah. life. Yeah. I mean, if it were Van Gogh, you'd wait. For, that would be the end of Act One, you know. <laughs> slice off the ear. I don't well, know. I think, you know, you say in, there's a comment in your book, which is filled with just wonderful anecdotes and details about the fact that so little is known about Seurat as a personality, his biography is little known, gave you that freedom right. to invent. And I think you make the comment that if we had done a musical, a musical about Van Gogh, you have to have the ear cutting right, episode. And yeah, that was Mr. Sondheim who said that. Okay, yes. who needs that? Yeah. Well, it did strike me, l let me say as a curator and art historian who knows a little bit about this period, that the the impression of Seurat as an artist, his working method, his relationships that come through in the musical seem to me to be authentic and true to 
what we know of the historical figure. So whether it was by chance or by Well, we eventually did our homework. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, I just didn't want to do the homework at the beginning because yeah. then you would be kind of, you know, hedged in in what you were doing. This way we could do what we wanted to do and then compare it to what the reality was. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just spend, I thought it might be helpful for all of us to spend just a very few minutes talking about the painting as a work of art in please, history. Please do. And because I think it, it does help set this, it does help to know a little bit about Seurat and what he was attempting to do as we then explore the themes of, of the play. And we're, we're going to show a clip too, which I think would be, be great of, of, of Mandy Patinkin and Bernadette Peters, of course, who were so brilliant in the original production. But Seurat was a younger generation of the Impressionists. He, he, he is, he, he's sometimes called a post-Impressionist, but he really was an Impressionist in the sense that he was deeply engaged with that moment in the history of French art where artists were finding ways to paint the world around them, particularly the life and leisure of Paris, in an honest and um, direct way, capturing the, the kind of public spectacle of life in Paris on canvases. He exhibited this painting, which is quite large, it's 10 feet wide, at the last of the eight group Impressionist exhibitions in 1886. So when people, here's a, here, here's a, little, uh, a little trick. If someone asks you, well, who qualifies as an Impressionist? Yeah, I was gonna ask. My answer is, Anyone who exhibited in one of the Impressionist group exhibitions. <laughs> and, and so but how did you get into the exhibit? How did you get your work in there? It must have been somewhat By negotiation and pleading. And, and actually, by the, this was the last of eight Impressionist exhibitions. And by the time the development of this one came about, there were, the, the group was quite fractious. And Seurat and his cohort represented a new direction in the way they technically painted their picture that other artists were upset by. So in the eighth Impressionist exhibition, Monet and Renoir, you know, the two most famous Impressionists, refused to exhibit because they didn't like what Seurat represented. We can talk a little bit about that, but just to give you a sense in the next slide, um, here's a classic great early Impressionist painting, right? This is Auguste Renoir painting about 10 years before Seurat's painting, 1875. Um, famous painting at the Musée d'Orsay, the ball at the Moulin de la Galette. And it's in many ways a similar theme to the mm. Grand Jatte, right? It shows Parisians mixing in the open air and having a good time. Here they're dancing, they're drinking, they're in conversation. But it's very different in, in so many ways from Seurat, isn't it? Um, there's a spontaneity, there's a, there's a sense of camaraderie. The figures are in conversation, they're grouped together. The light is, is, you know, picks them out in ways that seems to tell a story. Any idea how long it would have taken him to paint this painting? Well, I mean, it's a good question. Not as long as the Grand Jatte, which took two years. <laughs> Typically, an Impressionist picture like this would have been painted on the spot in the open air, in you know, a very few hours. Maybe the artist would take it back to the studio and work it up a bit or come back. This is a picture that is rather large in scale for an Impressionist painting. It's, it's probably five feet across. Mm. And so Renoir very likely took more time than usual on it and he would have brought it back to the studio and worked on it but always with this sense of trying to capture the fleeting spontaneity. moment. Spontaneity. Spontaneity, yeah. the improvisational aspect to it. And Seurat was doing something very different. Sort of the opposite. <laughs> no spontaneity. Well, he did in his drawings and his yeah. studies, right. but when he actually made the painting, final painting itself was kind it of... It became a kind of grand opus, like a machine. Yeah. Um, and just to give you a sense of the scale, <laughs> I, I couldn't, I know, I couldn't resist. Um, this is the painting hanging at the Art Institute of Chicago, and of course this is a clip where Cameron is sort of mesmerized by the picture when he and Ferris Bueller are in the museum. It just gives you a sense of the scale. So it was by large, it is by large, it, it is by far the largest 
Impressionist painting ever painted. You know, two meters by three meters, so about 10 feet across. And so that sets it apart. It's kind of a work apart from the average uh, Impressionist painting, like the Renoir. Not that that's an average picture. Um, but to get to what you were saying, James, here's, a, I think, a pretty telling detail. A detail from the Renoir Moulin de la Galette and a detail from the Sura. And I think you can see this on the screen, how Renoir is still, in, in that period, using that flickering brush stroke to capture a sense, just a sensation of light, air, atmosphere, a city in movement, a city in flux, you know, a modern city that is all about the contingent, right? And you see these people overlapping, they're, they're engaged with each other, and the, the, the technical means that mm -hmm. he used reinforces that. You know, it's, it's a city in motion mm -hmm. and exciting. On the other hand, if you look at the detail from the Sura, it's a completely different approach. Methodical, it's deliberate, it's based on very purposeful ideas about color harmonies and, and um, how colors play off of each other. Renoir would have mixed his paints on the palette to get the color mm -hmm. he wanted. Seurat's innovation and what kind of upset the traditionalists, the traditional impressionists, was he had this theory based in the science of the day that if you broke a color up into its constituent hues and then painted very small strokes, he started with little strokes, but then they became dots, you know, the famous pointillism, mm -hmm. and created a green out of, say, dots of yellow and dots of blue, that it would give a painting more vibrancy, more luminosity, because your eyes would optically mix the colors on your retina. And it's a theory that you know may or may not actually work in practice, but it was deeply held theory of trying to bring a rigor and a science to the improvisational quality of Impressionism. And so it caused quite a lot of conflict among the various members of the group. And you had told me when we were chatting before that Seurat had a politi political, did you say that he, he belonged to a radical political group or was uh, there were some politics behind both the Impressionists and politically what he was, uh, I mean, it's a little, were? Yeah, it's a little bit unclear what his personal views were, but the people he associated with, like Félix Fénéon, a critic, and, and um, fellow artists like Paul Signac were, were anarchists. Anarchists, right. And quite radical left-wing artists who were trying to create a form of art that was, in, in many ways, democratic. You could learn it. It was a system. It didn't necessarily depend on personal genius or skill. Hmm. You could learn it. Now, of course, that quickly changed later when people began to see pointillism, this kind of approach, to be a bit monotonous, dull, and rote. And at that point, the, the, the neo-impressionists, as they were called, began to try to introduce more of a personal style into their art. Um, Do you think there was, um, I mean, his choice of characters here, for want of a better word. Um, for instance, when we started working on this, we didn't know till very late in the game that the girls who are fishing on the left were actually prostitutes. And that was their way of letting men mm -hmm. know that they were available to them. Yeah. So um, I just wonder, you know, this yes. is 40 years later, but whether politically, you know, he's got the horn player, he's got soldiers in there, um, well, don't forget the monkey. The monkey. I don't know the significance of the monkey and... Oh, I think we do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Educate me. <laughs> no, I don't know. Listen, it's, it's actually rather controversial who these figures are and who they represent because Surah, unlike... With, with a lot of um, 
paintings from this period, really super realistic ones or even traditional impressionism, you can identify the figures through their costume. Seurat has a tendency to reduce everything to a kind of ideal, almost platonic ideal of, of figures and costume. But we can say, we can identify a few, and I don't know if I can, if I point on this screen, it's not gonna show up here, but I'll just walk you through it. The, 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 the tall woman on the right with the bustle and the umbrella, right? Um, she must be from the demi-mondaine, some kind of Parisienne, probably a, a, a woman one could hire. Right. She does have a pet monkey on a leash, which, you know, monkeys would have been associated with lasciviousness and, you know, kind of exotic behavior. She's, <laughs> she's arm in arm with, an arm in arm with a man, a client, question mark, who, with a top hat. Then on the left-hand side, lying, uh, lying down on his elbows is smoking a pipe, is a man who is very clearly a boatman. He right. would have been someone who, I don't know if he has an eye patch the way he does in the play, but maybe on the other side, you can't see well, the other side. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, we thought he had a peg leg, too. A peg leg. You know, because it was <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the two women in the middle ground in shadow, in the, in the shade there, one with an umbrella, are just probably shop girls, you know, girls from the petite bourgeoisie who would have just come to the island for a Sunday afternoon. And then, I don't know if you can see right past the boatman by that one tree, there's a shape with a white hat and a kind of red scarf coming right, down. Yeah. That That has traditionally been uh, identified as a nursemaid, a woman seated seen from behind, she, but she's very abstracted the way Seurat. So anyway, the point is there are people here and then soldiers in the background and a musician playing a trumpet. There are people, children running around, people from different walks of life, different social classes who would have come to this little spit of an island which is in the Seine River northwest of Paris. If you go there today, it's been totally overbuilt. There's a little bit of a park at the end, but it doesn't have this kind of Arcadian oasis sense that you see in Seurat's painting. So it was a place where people from different walks of life would mingle on a given Sunday. But of course, what Seurat does, which Renoir doesn't do, is he seems to isolate all the figures, right? right? They don't interact. And we don't really get any sense of their relationship to each other or anything like that. So that's why one of the things that I love about the play, of course, is you're able to, to give these, many of these figures, character, identity, relationships, they speak to each other, they, they, they enact little dramas in a way that, for the most part, one would see in more anecdotal paintings of the period. So this is a contemporaneous painting by a little known, academic salon artist, you know, the sort of realist painting that was very popular in the official salon. But this is the a Sunday on La Grande Jatte, you know, in 1878. Mm -hmm. And here, you know, the costumes are much more distinct. You can identify these people. The activity is clear. There's, they're picnicking and this boatman is bringing wine and, you know, there's an exchange where we can begin to imagine a story. So what I was doing, he's after something else. He's after something that's more like the art of the classical tradition. You know, Puvi, he, some referred to him as sort of the Puvi de Chavan of Impressionism. Puvi being an academic painter who made big murals, large scale paintings of Arcadian scenes like this. So, cool. so that's probably enough of the art history. <laughs> um, the one thing I wanted to ask you, James, in reading the book, bringing together the, the, the musical, creating it, was in some ways very much like making a painting, starting with the bits and pieces and making a whole. Were you aware of sort of that process when you were, when you were making the, the play with Sondheim, that it was sort of analogous to the way Seurat created his masterpiece? Well, in a word, no. Um, <laughs> I, um, 
I think you're right, though. I, I think, as Seurat, of course, did so many studies prior um, to the final paintings that he did, um, I think we approach character, kind of how you're talking about it, figuring out who all these people were, and then finding our studies were little scenes um, of the interaction of these people and defining them who they were for an audience. And I think what you said is quite true, that it was, uh, he did a lot of studies of the park with nobody in it. And our show actually begins with an, a, an empty white canvas, and then we bring in all the elements of the park without anyone in it, and then we bring in our lead character um, on stage and begin with a study of her. But um, no, I think we learned, or I, I, I think Steve would agree, we learned about Seurat as we went along. And um, I think it was a good way to create something. So we didn't feel compelled to do what he did, but um, I think it informed a lot of what we decided to do and, and how we went about writing the musical. And it's interesting that we wrote this musical w exactly 100 years after the fact that uh, we started it 100 years after the fact Seurat started his painting and we finished it two years later, <laughs> the musical, after he had spent two years writing, uh, creating his painting. So there was something just too perfect about the symmetry of it all. Um, and was totally accidental. So. That, that's amazing. We want to show a clip from the musical, but before we do, just because the clip is very much related to this funny painting that Seurat made of his, of his mistress, Madeleine Nodbloch, um, in 1888, so a couple of years after the Grand Jap. But, but tell me, set up the clip for us about how this particular picture well, inspired you. Yeah. Um, it just, this relationship was so interesting and we started writing it before and creating our own relationship before realizing how real actually what we were creating actually happened. He was so secretive um, that he actually had a child with this woman, um, but he went home to dinner with his mother every night and never told his mother <laughs> that A, he had a mistress, and B, that she had a grandchild. Um, and uh, she, unfortunately, and the child both died uh, fairly young, and it gave us the freedom to create whatever character we wanted because there was none there. And so what you're going to see is a number called Color and Light. And it comes it's about one third way through the first act. And um, his mistress, who we call Dot, um, is getting ready to go out to the Follies, which he's going to take her to. And he's completely involved in his painting on the other side of the studio. And, um, okay. and this is Mandy Patinkin and Bernadette Peters. Yeah. Man, and it, it, doesn't it look like Bernadette Peters? I mean, come on. So um, <laughs> it just, uh, yeah. And I like, you know, it's so brilliant the way Steve did it. You know, he's painting the painting and she's painting herself. And, um, you know, her art is her. That's a woman at that time, um, you know, was what she, her power was her beauty. And, and um, that gave her power in the relationship and in, in some degree in the, the small world they were part of. And his passion towards his painting versus sort of her passion to create the woman that she wants to be uh, him to love. Okay, well with that, we'll, let's start the clip. It's about three or four minutes. It's not the that. entire uh, number, it's about four minutes of it. Order. Design. Composition. Tone. Form. Symmetry. Balance. More red. And a little more red. Blue, blue, blue. Blue, 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 even, even, good. Bum, 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 bum. More red. More blue. More beer. More light. Color and light. Color and 
white. Yellow and white. Just blue and yellow and white. Look at the ants. See what I mean. No, look over there, miss. That's done with green. Conjoined with orange. to fit me right. The less I wear, the more comfortable I feel. More rouge. George is very special. Maybe I'm just not special enough for him. If my legs were longer, if my bust was smaller, if my hands were graceful, my waist was thinner, if my hips were flatter, if my voice was a wall, if I could concentrate, I'd be in the folly, I'd be in the cabaret, Woo! gentlemen in dolls of hats, and linen fans would wait for the flower. They'd only want me more if I was a scholarship. Nah, I wouldn't like it much. Married men and stupid boys, and too much smoke, and all that noise, and all that color and light. And you proper today, miss? Your parasol so properly cocked. Your bustles are perfectly upright. No doubt your chin rests at just the proper angle from your chest. And you, sir, your hat's so black. So black to you, perhaps. So red to me. None of the others worked at night. So composed for a Sunday. Nothing worked without the right, right, white, light. Have you found a George? Red, 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 orange, red, red, orange, orange. Pick a blue, pick a red, pick a orange. From the blue, green, blue, green, blue, green. Circle on the violet diagonal. Diagonal, no, yellow, comma, yellow, comma. Num, 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 num. Sitting red, that perfume blue all night, blue green, the window shut, that, 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 sitting, dot, dot, waiting, dot, dot, getting, fat, 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 more yellow, dot, dot, waiting to go out, out, out. No, 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 George, finish the hat, finish the hat, have to finish the hat first, hat, 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 in here. Sunday. I mean, it's, it's so wonderful and great and amusing, but also moving. And I mean, let's talk about the music because the, the music is so, is so brilliant, the score, but also just the, st the, the staccato rhythm. It's like, you know, it's obvious it's a musical equivalent of Seurat's technique, sequentialism. Right. Can, can you talk about that? Are you no. Are allowed to talk about it? No. <laughs> but um, we have somebody here who can talk about it. Really? Yes. You're going to see the man himself. Put him on. Well, he was here. I don't know where he went. Yay! Hey. <laughs> Hi there. Hi there. Is it really you, Maestro? It that's a song by Frank Lesser. Anyway, is it really you? <laughs> um, uh, yes, it's really me. And hello, everybody. Hi, James. Hello, Steve. It's wonderful. Isn't this nostalgic? Yeah, it is, isn't it? It really is. is. You know what I was realizing when I watch it, which is so incredible, being the director of the show, is Steve, you know, when she's plucking each of those eyebrows, that's like written in the score, <laughs> you know, and, and every detail that you saw came from this man's imagination and is written in that score. It's like a map, and when you're directing it, you just want to honor that, that map and, and tie together the action with the song, particularly all those pointillists. Are they all written as well, the commas and the dots and the... 
been a long yep. time. Uh, as a matter, I, I learned that um, from Jerry Robbins when we were doing West Side Story. And what he taught me was that don't just leave the staging to the director and the choreographer. <laughs> Stage it yourself. Stage it yourself and then let the director and the choreographer take off from that. Do what they want with it. But So I always plan numbers meticulously and the director often and should ignore them. But it gives him a, a, a place to go from where he knows what I intended. And then he can do whatever he wants with it to get the invention across. And of course, James is uh, meticulous that way. Didn't um, didn't you hand a song, and I may be wrong about this, to Jerry Robbins uh, that you had written, and he gave it back to you and said, "You you stage it." Yes, <laughs> that was Maria. Um, <laughs> I, I, he said, "So uh, I don't understand what what is he doing while he's singing Maria?" I said, "He's standing on the stage, Jerry, and singing it to the audience." <laughs> and he says, "Yeah, but what is he doing?" I said, "Well, he's on his on his way back to he's on his way to Maria's house." He says, you stage it. I said, <laughs> you have to give me something specific to stage, not say he's on his way to Maria's house. So anyway, that's, that's, it, it's that song that, that where I learned my lesson. But, you know, I was 25 years old, so I had a lot to learn. Mm. That's it. Okay. What, what I find so extraordinary about Sunday in the Park is the how the dialogue and the singing and the, the music are interwoven. There are very there aren't sort of breaks where suddenly a song mm. a, 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 an actor starts singing a song. It's all interwoven. So that must have come right right out of your very close collaboration from the start, right? Was that sort of a well, breakthrough here? Well, uh, uh, we talked about the songs in great detail before I started to write them, the way we would talk about how they worked in the scenes. Why was music necessary to the scene? Why, in fact, was music necessary to the piece? Mm. And you have to answer those questions very specifically if you're going to make a blend that seems like one piece, which is what we were trying to do, which is to blend our voices, blend the book and the songs, so they seem like what you just said, which is um, one flowing piece. And you just do that by a lot of talk. Yeah, I think um, uh, I had written a little bit about the fact that I almost wrote the entire uh, book for Act One before Steve dove in. He was working all along, but... Um, you know, I work with a lot of different kinds of composers and composer lyricists, and they'll deliver you a song before you've even finished writing or whatever. But this project came s really working um, side by side, uh, as Steve says, to figure out why people sing. And I think what's great about it is you often don't realize they're singing, that you're going right from dialogue into song, <coughs> And it's just um, seamless, and sometimes in the song they're speaking as well. And I think it uh, it lent itself to this particular material. Mm -hmm. I don't know. A lot of shows don't do that. They kind of stop dead for a number and then right. start and this up was again. new for the time, right? It's one of the great innovations. I don't know. Was this new for the time? I have no idea. I don't think no. so. No, 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 not new. <laughs> no, but uh, no, it, it had been. I, some of my shows have been already done. That's but, true. Yeah. You know. Um, no, many shows. Uh, it's something that Rodgers and Hammerstein started. Oh, that's true. Which was, yeah, let's yeah. have a musical that doesn't just have songs, dialogue, songs, dialogue, song, scene. Let's blend them. And the iconic moment that that happened and really changed musical theater history was the so-called bench scene in Carousel, right? which uh, is a combination of song and dialogue. You don't know where one begins and where one ends. And it just makes one long rhapsody. And um, it affected everything following. So ours is just, you know, the same kind of thing. So it's the way I was brought up, because as many of the audience may know, Hammerstein was my mentor and sort of surrogate father. And uh, so I got that all from him. And that's what we, we did. But that's also what James is interested in, which is, you know, let's, let's not have numbers. Let's have 
one canvas, so to speak. And that's what we did. What about, um, I think it'd be interesting for people to know a little bit about how you found the music and the score uh, as it relates to the painting, what it suggested to you musically. Well, as Rich just sa uh, said, um, the, um, the, the pointillism theme came because I was trying to imagine what Surat was doing with his hand while he was painting those dots. Bing, 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 I thought, okay, got to have a rhythm or something that goes with that. Now, in fact, when I really looked at the painting, they're not dots at all. They're daubs. There he's going. So that doesn't make for a lot of exciting music. Dum, 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 dum. And it wouldn't have helped the pace. So um, I imagined him doing that. And um, I also, I, here's a case where you can, uh, uh, you can overanalyze. I thought, isn't it interesting that Surratt's palette had 12 colors on it, or 10 colors, I guess, in black and white. And coincidentally enough, there are 12 notes in the musical scale. So I thought, oh, when he's combining red and orange, so I will combine by that. So I kept, now, anybody who knows any kind of, anything about music knows, if you take two notes that are one half step apart, right next to each other, you go, it sounds like mistake. And it is completely useless. <laughs> so, it was, so, it was, but it, it pleased me in theory. Uh, but, it was, but that's one of those places where you, you have to you have to let uh, something take over from the particular technique. But um, but the that motion. Also, I thought that was uh, something of George's emotion was mm -hmm. that kind of. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, impatience. Um, I should add that mm -mm, when James talked about writing the first act, that I always wait for uh, a librettist to write something so I can get into the librettist's mind, into the librettist's style, into the characters that, the, even though you can s s talk about it forever, but until it's there on paper, you don't get something to imitate, which is what I do as a composer is I try to imitate what the librettist has conceived. So I had to get in, James had to write some, some aspects of the characters, meaning a couple of scenes, before I could properly, you know, I knew what he was doing, but until I hear it or see it on page, on paper, I can't um, get into it. And so that's why I, I always wait for a book writer to write a couple of scenes so I can get into the character. I, I approach songs as an actor approaches dialogue. As I can get into the character if I can and then express it. Yeah, I think it's, it's why a lot of musicals are based on other material, you know, often mm. based on movies that are yeah. adapted to musicals or uh, stage plays that become musicals. And that way, when you're collaborating together, you have your map. Mm -hmm. So you can jump into it and you all know where you're going and who the characters are yeah. and the structure. But here we were, it wasn't like, the only thing I knew was that we were going to end the act with a recreation well, of the, the painting. Yeah, so that was a great thing to move for. But right. of course you, we didn't you had know, a destination. we didn't know who any of those characters were. Yeah. So, uh, and Steve wrote some pretty I, lengthy songs for those people who ended up getting all their songs cut. Yeah. In, in, our, in our workshop production, Playwrights Horizons, all those characters, like the soldier and the two girls fishing, had little songs that would express who they were. And when we developed the show for Broadway, we decided that those were unnecessary, that all that was necessary was a splash of each of them instead of a whole song. Also, I think I'd like to uh, tell the audience that um, there's this painting and you don't know who these people are. And what James did when we first began was he took a piece of, of drawing paper, of, of transparent paper, and outlined who the, the outlines of the figures in the painting with a little question mark or, or arrow saying, 
mother, mistress, etc. He assigned characters to each of those foreground figures, the seven foreground figures in the painting, and that made it a play. That's great. Mm -hmm. can, can I raise something, Steve? You mentioned a few minutes ago you brought up the actor as part of the process, and we have a, we have a question from our online audience, which I, I found interesting. I was wondering whether you can point to any scenes, songs, dialogue, plot points, influenced by the capabilities, talents of the cast, Mandy and Bernadette. And if there are such points, whether you've ever thought about how different the musical might be now, had you begun with different actors? Well, yeah, it was interesting because Steve envisioned, for starters, Sarah to be a, a, a lyric baritone or a baritone and Dot to be a soprano. And we, of course, ended up casting two people who didn't sing in those vocal ranges. So <laughs> right out of the gate, you know, Mandy has that high yeah. tessitura and Bernadette's kind of more of a chest voice. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know. W what do you think, Steve? Um, well, um, when Mandy uh, sang for us, um, and it was such a ringing tenor, I thought, I, I'd written it for a bass baritone because I thought Surat is a repressed character. And a repressed character doesn't sing like that. A repressed character, repressed character sings like this. And, oh, yes. Oh, I love you, darling. You know? And um, so, but Mandy, Mandy's uh, audition, so to speak, was so brilliant. And also, we, <laughs> we gave him the dog song. And he auditioned, get this, three different dogs for each of the dogs in the painting. <laughs> there are two dogs in the painting, and Mandy invented three different personalities using the same lyrics and the same music. And we thought, you know, Gotta cast that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just wonderful. Um, um, as as for Dot, that was that was easy because Bernadette can, Bernadette can act chest voice even when she's singing <laughs> soprano. I mean, she's so versatile. Um, so uh, there was no real problem, and I won't say that the actors uh, influenced the score uh, in any way, except course, in the course of putting the show together, you say, Dot needs another song here, George needs another song there. But that's not about the actors, it's about the characters, really. Now, some of the characters were pretty clearly drawn from mm -hmm. the way Seurat drew them. Yeah, yeah. The boatman's the boatman, right. so that was an easy one to write. But the two characters behind them were just up for grabs, so... Um, yeah, but, but you invented the boatman, James. There was nothing in the painting that said, this is a boatman. In fact, uh, as Richard said, it probably wasn't. Well, I, I thought he looked like a boatman. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Not that I know what a 19th century boatman looked like, but if I had to well, guess, I'd say, well, that looks good, okay. I re well, I remember um, from the book, there's the anecdote where I think Steve mentioned the tracing paper where you identified yeah. all the characters. And I think, Steve, you said you're missing one character. And James oh. said, who? And you said, the artist. And of course... No, quite the reverse. It was James who said oh, Okay, that. it was the other way around? When, all right. When, <laughs> on our first meeting, when I said, boy, that looks like a stage set. And isn't it interesting that nobody's looking at anybody else? Mm -hmm. I wonder what they're all hiding from. I mean, there's some kind of drama here of some sort. And James said the main character is missing, namely the artist. And, you know, the light went off in the room. It's called one of those aha eureka moments where we suddenly knew we had a musical, or at least a play. <laughs> yeah, it was a play for a while, yeah. but finally we got the music in there. It was good. Here, here's, a, here's a question. Um, did creating this musical, looking so deeply into a work of art, change the way you looked at paintings afterwards? Mm. You start trying to come up with musicals for every painting you look oh, at. Oh, you mean, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, not really, but uh, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, no. Uh, but I think working on this particular painting certainly 
made me appreciate more what goes into a painting. Um, obviously, this was one very labor intensive and narrow in its view, but um, you know, it ain't abstract. You know, when you're doing this kind of work, and where they were in the 19th century, and you also realize how how bold it was mm -hmm. for whatever reason to choose to do it this way. Well, there's a sort uh, of a follow up question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'd like to interrupt. Um, James, uh, uh, when we were writing him, James said, let's go watch a painter paint. Right. That, he yeah. knew a painter in, in, uh, 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 in like, Greenwich Village a a area in New York City. And we went, and this was an abstract painter. Mm -hmm. painting, but you watched him make his choices between red, blue, lime, or whatever it was. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm somebody who's, who's non-visual, and uh, it was certainly a lesson to me. And, um, and, but studying the Syrah was the big lesson, seeing that they weren't dots, that they were these little daubs of paint. And also, James, I think it would be useful. We went to, when we went to Chicago to look at the painting. Um, there were that we were uh, helped by a couple of curators there, and James had written about this object in the middle of the painting, which was Louis's waffle stove, the waffle stove that uh, you know uh, belonged to the guy who eventually married Dot. And James, you want to? <laughs> recount what happened, because the curators come. And we said, what is that? And they each had a different answer to what, what, what this object was. James chose it to be a waffle stove. We have no idea what it was actually. Yeah, the other was a baby carriage. Yeah, either a baby yeah. carriage or a waffle. But <laughs> apropos what Steve's saying, and what the earlier question that was asked about an actor informing the character, um, the friend Joe that we were watching painting would have, you know, three, four brushes in each hand and he would dab and dab and then take the other brush that's red and and Mandy took that upon himself as well if you notice he's got several paintbrushes in his hand and he literally knew which was the white one which by the way I don't think there was any black on the I think no, Syrah no, never worked with black no. yeah no. And, but, and, and the bottle of beer was that you just beer no I think that was Steve's that's great. No, that was, I beer. just thought you gotta get a joke in here someplace. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just thought. Yeah, I just thought. Here's a man working really hard and and having all these internal uh, uh, thoughts or feelings or fantasies. I thought, but he's in a room, maybe in a hot room, and he is sweating his. Uh, I can't use the word. I guess on TV, <laughs> off, and he must be thirsty, and so he's saying. All of this and all this, and then beer, and that's all. <laughs> it, it, was, it was when I, I when I say it was a joke. What I meant was it was a lighthearted moment in which he came back into reality from the trance he was in while he was painting. And it also gives him a bit of humanity. I mean, this guy who's so obsessive and you know is pushing Dot away, but he's also a regular guy who needs a swig of beer while he's working. Yeah, and it gives it a little bit of. I always Expansive wonder whether character. you picked beer because I always was drinking beer out of a bottle. I don't know. I always kind of. No, it, it's one. It's one syllable and easy to rhyme. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't rhyme it, but one syllable. No, but it needs that punch up more. You know. Yeah. You're going to say more red, more blue. You don't want to say more. Uh, Martini. Uh, Martini. I mean, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I know we uh, want to get to some questions from the audience, but I did have one thing I wanted to bring up, and that just, you mentioned talking to the curators at the Art Institute of Chicago about the painting. Right. And I did want to talk a little bit about Act Two, which you know, is, is very different from the first act. In, in re-watching the musical this past week, I was struck by how spot on, just as, just as the first act is spot on about the artistic process in Seurat and creating this masterpiece. The second act is really spot on about life in an art museum. You know, the way you characterize the, the sort of officious director, you know, taking the opportunity to fundraise when there's a breakdown in the chromolume or the chatter at the reception, mm. you know, the talk about contemporary art. 
I mean, where did that come from? And because it, it, it still holds up, I think, very much. And it's kind of, you, you got to know, you, you got museum roles down really Yeah, well. I'm not sure <laughs> that I knew that much about the museum world, but I knew about the art world, and I knew a lot of artists. And I knew uh, about, as it is today, getting grants, getting shows, you know, trying not to be jealous of the person that you're supposedly friendly with, whose work somehow gets shown and yours doesn't. <laughs> so um, I think also it's not so far from the world of the theater. Mm. You know, if you just imagine some of those people being theater owners and uh, theater producers. And um, so it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't like I did any research on the world of museums, but I'm, I think it was just indicative of any artist creating something and the machinery you have to go mm -hmm. through to get mm -hmm. grants, to make connections, to get your work done. And the younger George is still resistant to that whole part of well, the life. Well, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think what's interesting, what we wanted to do with the second act is have George, who was a success, and he was a success, and he mm -hmm. had this big museum show or whatever it was and um, but his soul was kind of dead from what he was doing right, because right. he was a commercial artist you know Seurat didn't sell a painting in his major painting in his lifetime so one always wonders you know what how how awful to have worked the way he worked and never had any taste of success really so we kind of went with the second act the opposite of someone who was successful but was playing the game which apropos of what you were talking about in the Impressionists and taking a route that others weren't taking, um, this second act, George, was somebody who could play the game pretty well, okay. but yep. knew he was just banging it out at this point. Great. Also, it, it's a reflection of the first act, uh, of, well, we don't see it, of what you were talking about, which is the, uh, those <coughs> Impressionist exhibitions where the uh, competition was fierce, Mm -hmm. and where everybody would try to take advantage of somebody else's weaknesses, whatever. I mean, so it, yeah. in that case, we, we have often been criticized, James and I, for, oh, the, second, the first act's fabulous, the second act, oh, who needs that? But as James pointed out, this is just the first act, it's just a stunt, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. second act is what the show is about. Mm. And um, so, I, uh, I think uh, I think the, the notion of the museum and the commerciality of uh, of contemporary art, uh, which does not negate the quality of the art, it's just mm. the use of it, yeah. is is uh, important. Yeah, we we visually, you know, you have the painting in the background, and then. We create our own contemporary tableau in the foreground mm -hmm. that relates, in a way, to the tableau in the painting itself. So there's a lot of um, kind of reflections of the real Seurat and and uh, his influence on the, on the present. Listen, we in the remaining few minutes, I want to open it up to the audience and see if there's mm -hmm. any questions from any of you. If you do have a question, please come down to the microphone at the at the end of the stairs here and ask your question. Anyone? Otherwise, we'll just go home. So no. <laughs> or we'll start asking you questions. <laughs> ah, here comes. No, the, here. I, I guess everything is self-explanatory. Ah, we we, <laughs> we have one here. Okay. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, when, you, uh, when you were writing this, did you have to worry about speaking to the estate or family of Sarah or anybody to that effect? Ah. Or did you take them into consideration when you were, obviously you did. I'm just curious. No. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no. You it, probably talked to the Art Institute of Chicago. Due to the second act, I thought maybe. Yeah, we talked, obviously, to the Art Institute because they have, the painting there. I don't think we ever really got the rights mm -hmm. to the painting, though. We had to get the rights to all the artwork for the book, but for some reason, we never had to get any of the rights mm -hmm. for the time. stage production. And I hope I'm yeah. not opening a can of worms <laughs> here. But sorry. 
Well, Sir, Sir Rob, Sir Rob would have First, been, what, what, he would have been out of copyright. Is there a Syrah estate? Is there, I didn't know there was a Syrah estate. No, there um, isn't, because I, he's, he would have been out of copyright long ago. Anyway. Yeah, that's right. He's in the public domain, but. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, maybe on this I mean, side? He has no living, rel uh, living descendants. So. Okay, go ahead. That we know of. Yeah, that we know of. <laughs> um, so the, it seems like the relationship between Dot and George is this very, they love each other very much and they're sort of like kept apart by their like intrinsic nature as people. What drew you to that sort of like tragic aspect of Oh, the fr friction between the art of uh, Dot and George? Yeah, well, yes. it's really about what you give up for your work, no matter what your work is and how your partner in life or whatever pays the price for your work, I guess, is what I would say. You know, it can go either way. But um, I, I don't, I mean, it is a very 19th century story. And I think one of the, if I may say so, the best scenes in it is between the two couples, between George um, and the other art, uh, art artist in the show, who's a very successful artist, and also his wife and uh, the Dot character. And of course, his wife is kind of jealous that she doesn't get painted because um, she's not got the right look, the right <laughs> angles, as it were. You know, so I think that those relationships uh, kind of just, I don't know where they came from, but they seemed mm -hmm. kind of interesting at the time. For, for what it's worth, the, the, the character, the, the person that Dot is based on, Sarah's mistress and common law wife, Madeleine Noblock, she didn't marry a baker and move to America. She, she did stay in France. Um, and she inherited much of his art. In I fact, didn't know, yeah. Yeah, we oh, have- Oh, really? Oh, wow, I didn't yeah, know that. We have, um, <laughs> two, we, we have four drawings in the Getty Museum by Sarah, and two of them came from no the kidding. estate of, I had estate no of idea. Madeleine Noblock, yeah. Well, I'm glad she, she did good. She did. <laughs> what, okay. what are the four paintings? Can you uh, uh, they're dra they're drawings. describe them? They're drawings. I, well, I have pictures of them. If you'd like. Would you like to see them? We'll, we'll have to make you go away, Steve, if that's all right. No. no uh, uh, his drawings make you me cry. I find... Okay. Stay on, uh, but... I'm, not, I'm not often moved. I'm not often moved by visual art, but I am sure moved by those drawings. Okay, well, let's take a, would we like to see them? Could yeah, we, bring them on. Could we switch to the Boy. slideshow, please? And I just have to zip through. Let me, okay, let's just, uh, those, th these are just some of the works that he used making the picture. Okay, so we have two, we have four drawings. This is actually quite moving and relevant. There's a portrait drawing of his mother, Oof. Madame Sua. Which, oh, yeah. he, you know, there he drew are. Her there, a lot. He drew her a lot. He drew her a lot. And there are scenes in the play where he's very close to her, drawing her face mm. that very much like this. And then the one on the right is a very unusual drawing, an early kind of wow. academic style drawing that he produced when he was still at the Ecole des Beaux Arts and shows uh -huh. what a brilliant conventional academic draftsperson he could be. This is a study of an old uh, man, a nude. Academic exercise, but uh, is brilliant uh, in terms of its technical. Uh, he did a lot of those. He did a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. An old he man who studying. was a bunhead. With a bunhead, yes. <laughs> and a long and a ZZ top beard. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh man! Look at this. Look the at other those. two we have. Oh my goodness! Oh, look at those. Gee whiz! These are these, these are great. Now the, these don't. These don't relate directly to the Grand Jatte painting, though they could. You have a woman, you know, in profile, promenading, very much like you see in the painting. But you also notice that she's probably in the studio. She seems to be standing in front of a large painting, so he would have just paint, uh, drawn her in the studio. And then the other one is a landscape made probably outside Paris of poplar trees. And it shows you can see the watermark of the paper because he liked this grainy paper where as, uh, he, as he rubbed the, the, black, the crayon noir over it, you get this wonderful 
effect that is similar to the Prentilis technique. Right. And I love that he signed his name in red. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I can't Ego. See that. So <laughs> these are very nice. Okay, let's go back to Steve, please. Um, and we have a question over here. Yes, hi. The answer is G major. Steve's not back yet. <laughs> What do you say? The answer is G yet. major. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Could we go back to st to the video of Steve Sondheim, please? Sorry. Thank you. Okay, your question. I didn't want to be rude. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to ask a question because I wanted to say how much I love both of you guys. I can't believe it's been 40 years. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh, well, thanks for the good news. <laughs> <laughs> about the business of theater. Did you guys get bankrolled before you started working together? Did you know that this play was going to be put on, the musical was going to be put on? Did someone start giving you money so you could live and work and not have to take another job while you were doing this? Well, I had a, a commission. I mean, it was a tiny commission from Playwrights Horizons, which was the theater I worked in, which was in a former uh, stripper club on 42nd Street before Disney arrived on 42nd Street. <laughs> and, um, uh, but no, we didn't have any, didn't make a dime until uh, I had that to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And uh, once we did the workshop, no, I don't think, uh, you don't make a lot, I don't know, I don't think any finances came in at all until actually the show got optioned by producers. I think, Sadly, I had to ask for uh, advance at some point because I literally had nothing going on. Well, what, uh, uh, it, uh, Playwrights Horizons is a nonprofit, uh, officially off Broadway theater, that uh, promotes new work. And James had a connection with them. And he and I decided, just as writers, to write a show. It wasn't hey, like, let's write a Broadway show. It was, let's write this, and at least we can get it on through Playwrights Horizons if it's any good, because of James's connection with Playwrights Horizons. The idea was to write a play and put it on. Uh, I don't think either of us, and it's not, not uh, carpet kicking, I don't think either of us had any idea that, hey, let's get this on Broadway and make money. We wanted to write the thing and get it produced, which we thought we could. So um, there was certainly no, quote, financing. And James and I had to make our own livings as we wished to. I, I already had some stuff um, running, and um, so I had money coming in. But that was not the idea. The idea was to write the piece. And we did. Cool. Go ahead, sir. Uh, from reading the book, which I enjoyed very much, I got a sense that uh, you, Mr. Lapine, would write uh, scenes and perhaps monologues, and then Mr. Sondheim would come in and bring a song in later on. And my question is, in terms of your creative collaboration, was there ever a time when you added something to a song or when Mr. Sondheim added something to the play itself uh, in your collaboration, or was it pretty much once Mr. Sondheim brought a song in, that was it? Well, it wasn't that simple because we would meet every week, and if Steve was working on a song, he would first um, read me some couplets that he had written for the song. He, he, he was sort of forensic and trying to get inside my head and figure out would the character say this, would the character say that, how would they speak. He certainly uh, took my use of language into his use of language for the lyrics, but I don't think we tinkered too much with each other's work once, you know, and then sometimes a song would come in and it would replace the dialogue that was there. So that's pretty much how musicals work. You, you want to be able to dramatize things in song, and so you obviously have to give over to the composer for that. And, and, and real quickly, was there a discussion between the two of you, for example, on finishing the hat, or did that all come from Mr. Sondheim? 
You know, once I got into uh, rehearsals for our little workshop, we weren't together as much. And I don't remember uh, a lot of dialogue on finishing the hat, though it came from the scene we were just looking at when Dot, he promises to take his girlfriend to the Follies and he, has to, he says, I have to finish the hat. And I'm assuming Steve went, that's a good line. That could be a song. <laughs> and, and, and wisely took it, but didn't put it there. He put it to yep. answer that in the middle of the first act, which is the great moment in the first act, because otherwise, you know, George Seurat was pretty distant, cold, mysterious, yeah. not a barrel of laughs kind of guy, you know? <laughs> and then to have a song like Finishing the Hat, where first he does a dog song, where he acts like a dog, and you go, oh, okay, the guy can get down a little. And then um, <laughs> he sings Finishing the Hat, and you realize he knows who he is. He knows what his limitations are, you know? He doesn't like the fact about himself that he can't follow through with this woman he loves, but this this is his passion, and I think that's when the audience understands what some people go through to create what they create in life. So. Thank you. Uh, that, mo that moment um, it, it seemed it needed a song for George when he sees his, the lady he loves uh, in the park and they're apart. It seemed like it needed a moment for him musically uh, to express himself. And that's why I wrote it. And I just took the line from James's scene, which is, you know, when she storms out uh, because he's not keeping a date with her for the follies. And he says, um, I'm finishing the hat. I have to finish the hat, he says. And I thought, well, okay, that's the moment. That's the moment where the, the crack in their relationship happened, at least in the, in, in the story of the play. As far as the monologues go, the one monologue that James wrote that I turned into a song was the opening one, Sunny Park with George. Um, we decided, you know, we'd have bring her out on stage in the mechanical dress, and she would be standing in a hot sun, resentful and loving at the same time, while George started to sketch her, and she would have an interior monologue, which James wrote. And then I turned the monologue into a song. And, the, and it was a truly collaborative process. Um, yeah. I thought so. I don't know what Steve feels. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it was collaborative. But that's what, I, what I've always done with <clears throat> of my collaborators, book writers, in, in all the shows I have, which is uh, that's what makes it, makes it a collaboration. Right. Yeah. Which is, you know... Uh, Everything has to come from the book writer is the writer of a musical. And everything depends on his plotting, his characters. Now, as a composer, you work with him on the plotting and the, the idea of the characters. But when it comes right down to it, it's his dialogue has to be transformed. And, um, or if not transformed, accentuated, punctuated by song. Okay. We have time, just one more question, I'm sorry, and then we have to wrap it up. You've all been a great audience. Could you Hi. ask Hi. your one question? Um, yeah, thank Sorry. you again <coughs> so much for wanting to write this brilliant piece. Um, my very important question that I wanted to ask is, um, Mr. Surratt being French, <coughs> why more beer? Why not more wine? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I think that's the perfect end to a wonderful program. I, before I can answer this, that. Okay. I can answer that. Go um, ahead. Go ahead. To an American audience, an American audience, more wine implies getting drunk, not having more energy to work. You don't say more wine when you're working like that. I think it doesn't seem to, so to me. And certainly to an American audience, wine suggests something else. Maybe in France, wine suggests the worker's uh, drink, which is 
over here would be beer. That's all. It's a question of what the audience takes from what you're writing, not the question of the truth. That's good. Okay. Good. Okay. Putting it together, fabulous book, lots Thank of you. wonderful stories and interviews <coughs> with everyone who participated. It really gets you behind the scenes and you know, tells you how, how to put on a Broadway play. So it's, uh, those of you online, there's a link on the, on the Zoom to purchasing the book. We're also, for those of you here, I think selling it right outside. So um, take a look, it's really great. And I can't thank our guests, both of you, enough. Thank you, James. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Steve, Steve, you got a standing ovation. Yeah, that was a standing ovation. <laughs> thank you all for coming. I'm yeah, telling you, you it's Theater no group. small task to get out, get there, be here with people. It's really, really heartwarming. So thank yeah, you. What for a great coming. pleasure. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah. And thank, thank, thanks to everybody who's watching on Zoom, too. Yeah, Good. thank okay. you to all our Zoom watchers. Okay. Thanks.